Good afternoon and welcome to episode 5 of All Things Ilias. This is your host, Omer Ilias, and I hope you're all doing well, you're doing great. We'll start off this podcast with an exciting news about football. Arsenal beating Manchester United 3-2 at the Emirates Stadium. I am super excited about the outcome. I was a bit nervous because of how United has progressed under Eric Ten Hag. However, there were no doubts that this Arsenal team could really overcome this test at the Emirates, and they did. So super excited about that. There's also the debut of the new acquisition from Brighton, Leandro Trossard, if I'm pronouncing my man's name right. Um, He had a good short cameo at the end of the game as well. So it's very good to see that exciting last minute winner for the Arsenal FC club. Huge progress under Mikel Arteta. I am enjoying and reveling the current success of the team that represents the Emirates. To start off this podcast, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but I've got a haircut. And I... uh, it was a traumatic experience, to say the least. You know when you go to a barber? Why do barbers, when you talk to them, like, uh, I need this haircut. Okay, yes, not short at the top. I'm trying to grow my hair out. One on the sides, not short at the top. Just make it even. Good? Okay, good. So he's buzzing. Zzz. He steps back. He looks at it. He's doing my sides. Zzz. He steps back. He looks at it. Um, I'm looking in the mirror. It's, it's going super well, almost to a point that I am hopeful because my usual barber was closed. These guys were open. It was Friday. I went in for a haircut. And then he stops the sides. I'm almost smiling because I'm happy because they look good. On the top, he holds my hair up and I say, don't go short. He says, not short. I say, not short. He says, not short. I say, not short. He says, okay. And I say it again. I say, not short. So he holds my hair up and he shows me how much. And I go, yeah. And then he cuts it. And I go, okay. Then he cuts it more. And he's, and then he steps back. He had this thing where he was and step back and and step back. And he did like eight circles around me. And I was interstellar Matthew McConaughey style crying. When he can see himself leaving his daughter, he's like, no, don't do it. That was me. But I couldn't say anything because it's done. So we just sit there and he's, he's having a chat with his mate. I can't understand it. And that's fine. And he keeps on going around and shorter and shorter and shorter. And now my hair on the top is shorter than the day that I went in. And that's, it is what it is. It's, it's beyond me how barbers can just go well your opinion doesn't mean anything because i am holding the scissors i am the captain now hey hey look at me i'm the captain now and he did what he wanted to do like i was his son and he was my dad and you know what i did i got up from that chair i paid for it I thanked him and I cried on the inside and I had my hat on for two days. I'm I'm now at this point, I'm at the stage of acceptance because a good thing about hair is that hair can always grow until it doesn't. So I can leave this experience behind in another two weeks. Anyways, uh, shaking myself out of that trauma. Um, I have been thinking about the ocean, about water. Because it's been some days here in Canberra have been a bit hot. The other days have been a bit cold. But the thing about me is that I cannot swim. And to dissect that problem, let's jump in. Let's jump in like a reporter jumps in 40 minutes into the report. 
will jump in immediately because I am a good reporter. Let's jump in and see what happened. When I was six or seven, all the cousins in my family, including uh, my brother and some cousins who came from the U.S., we went to a Sozo water park in Lahore. So we were all on the motorbikes. I was obviously not riding a motorbike. I was sort of like riding behind the guy. And um, so we go to this water park in Lahore. And as I'm close and we reach, like we have changed. We bought the tickets. I've got my shoes off, got my shorts on. I'm excited. Before this, I had never been in the water. And to give you a bit of history about that, when I was a baby, if you would pour just water on my head, I would start going. So my mom, whenever she washed my hair, she had to like wet her hand and then wash my head because I was just, I would stop breathing and freak out. That's important. It's an important detail that you're going to need to know. So we reached the pool. There's like a donut happening. And there's like like kids, adults, whoever is on. I, I, I can just hear them go, oh, and I'm, I'm like, yeah. And the land in that pool, like in the water, like little like pool at the end of it. My cousin, who is 6'2", was 6'2", still at the time, because he was always this, this like tall. He was born four feet, and then he just grew out immediately to 6'2". Um... He picks me up by the neck, choke slams me like he's the undertaker into the pool. As this is happening in slow motion, I can see the blue sky. And in a bit, it's just everything. I just go and there's water across my face. Um, and I'm like parallel. I'm not putting my feet down. And this is the longest time ever. I'm only six, but I'm thinking about my whole life, what I've done about school, about my mom telling me not to go and I'm regretting it and I'm thinking about my parents as I touch the floor. And my arms are out, slow motion, as I'm accepting my fate and then someone pulls me out the water. Because I realized my, my brother, he kind of like went, well, I think we should get him out because I want to go with the same number of people that left the Elias household, and that's two sons instead of one. So we need both of them back, including myself. Um, so that was the first time. That experience traumatized me. I was scared of the water. I realized that I couldn't swim or float. Still can't to this day. And... Um, Second thing that scarred me for life forever. So that's this pool thing. The ocean. I watched Jaws and Deep Blue Sea when I was fairly young. Right after the pool incident, like maybe a year or two within that. I watched both Jaws and Deep Blue Sea. So every time I can close, my, like every time I close my eyes, if I'm in a pool even, I can visualize a shark just chomping at the bits to get a piece of me, or a few pieces off me, actually, because I was small. Not that it has changed a lot since then. Um, so that's, like, scarred me forever. Like, the ocean just, like, freaks me out. And um, I went snorkeling in Malaysia with my friends. That story is also important because it's it will sort of expand on that deep dive into my fear of the ocean. So we went for this in the first year of uni. We go to this island trip to Tioman or Redang, I can't remember. So the group of friends in first year, we organize a trip. We go there. First day, we want to go snorkeling. And my friends who could swim were like, this is the best thing ever. You'll have your life jacket on, so you'll float. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about floating at all. And uh, it's going to be exciting. And I go, cool. That's fine. So we hop on board. I've got my life vest on, uh, life jacket on. And we're in this boat. We reach this snorkeling spot. And 
they all hop off. I look at the water and it's I can't stand in it because it's probably like eight feet deep. And that kind of uh, that was my first sign of like danger, danger. You should not be doing this. Think about Sosa Water Park. Anyhow, I slowly get in the water, but the thing is that my life jacket was a bit loose. So as I went in the water, it sort of rose up to my chin. So I immediately freaked out. I'm like, oh, oh, and I'm sort of, you know, and, and my friends are like, just relax. It's fine. You're not drowning. But since I was so like panicky, I would sort of go underwater just like a little bit. And my head was just out and I'm jumping in. My friend, he comes back and he goes, well, it's okay. I'll help you swim. And I'm sort of like holding on to him and he just like turns away from me. He moves in front of me and you know what he does? He goes, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And I cannot believe that this man is so oblivious to my fear. He's doing this shit to me in the water. That doesn't make you swim. So I'm trying to grab him, but he's like swimming away because he knows what, what he's doing. And while this is happening, this coral two or three feet deep and I don't see it because my head's out of the water and I'm panicky and my left knee lands into the coral like I, I just knee it every ounce of energy that I had I could have my all hopes and dreams and my will to live was taken out in that single blow I felt lifeless and the pain just ran through my whole body and I go oh and now he's just doing this and now he's gone away. So I look down and I see coral. I haven't ever seen coral because I've never been in the water. I was born in the city of Lahore, which is landlocked. We just have the, uh, we have the rivers and the canals, but again, I've never been into the water. So now I try to use the coral to stand sort of, um, stand on top of it. So I've got my balance. So I can like sort of have a plan of action. Because the life jacket, I can't trust anymore. I'm not thinking about making it a bit tight. It's just, it's lost my trust. There's no relationship left there. It's gone. It's vanished. The thing about coral is that it's sharp as shit. So as I stand on it, my feet now are just cut up. I'm trying to be a bit light on my feet, but I can't. I'm scared, so I try to sit on it. I hit my other knee. Pain, pain, pain. I am scanning the area to have like a plan of action. Now I see a few rocks. The like like the boat at this point is probably eight feet behind me, but there's water, so I can't obviously go. So I scope the area. I'm on the coral. I hop on towards some like rocks. They're slippery. I slip a couple times, but I'm hanging on, and I hop 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 around to where the boat has been anchored by a rope, and I latch onto the rope. And then I make my way up back into the boat and I don't go in the water again. And I wait for my friends to finish snorkeling. And um, the interesting thing about that is that no one told me, like I was told that there were no sharks in Malaysia for some reason. And I believed it without looking it up, without verifying what was relayed to me it was a lie. Obviously, I just thought, yeah, cool. No sharks here, but there's sharks in Malaysia. And that's important. Another embarrassing um, encounter. So I asked a friend of mine to sort of help me learn how to float. She was kind enough to uh, volunteer for this humongous challenge. Um, and we went to the Sysak pool in Belconnen. On the way there, I was advised to buy some pool noodles so they can help me float. And just for, as a precaution, I bought two of them because I'm a grown man. Now, we're in the shallow side of the pool. So there's like kid lanes and then right next to it on the shallow side is your boy. So I'm, I've got the two noodles and like wrapped underneath my armpits. I'm on them and I'm just slowly trying to learn how to paddle my feet and float. Uh, with the pool noodles, I'm doing exceptionally well. I can swim. 
I can move in the water. I just can't stay up like I start sinking. Like my hopes and dreams. Um, so the kid at this point, so there's a girl, a child, who's uh, in the next lane. And um, she says, excuse me. And this kid is like probably four. So half her teeth are not even like in her like mouth. They're like falling out. And she's like, excuse me, can I grab, since we have two pool noodles, can I grab a pool noodle for my sister so she can swim? And the sister is two years old. And I look at them and now the other kids have heard what she said. They're looking at me, the man with two pool noodles. I look right at them. I look at the sky. I think, oh Lord. And look back at them and I say, no, you can't. Because I need both of them. And she's so confused. And she says, why? And I say, well, I'm learning how to float. And I'm heavy. And she says, why can't you float? And now her sister, who's two, is laughing at me. Other kids, like six of them have lined up. And they are smiling and giggling and looking at me as I'm holding on to my two pool noodles that I am not ready to share because I need both of them to be able to stay afloat. And she's like, well, why can't you swim? And I say, because I'm brown. And she, well, you're like, you know when you say something to the kids and they just, they, they just don't understand it? And they sort of just go, hmm, hmm. And then she says, you want to see a trick? Because now she's trying to establish like dominance. She's, she's, like, she's like trying to piss on me with her giant hog to establish dominance. And I go, yeah. And then she does like a little, like just like a VD, like a childish like trick. She spins in the water. She comes out and she's like, can you do that? And as I'm hanging on to my two pool noodles, I go, no. And then she announces, she's like, he can't swim. And at this point, sort of the adults, because the parents are around, they're looking at me with the kids all lined up with my two pool noodles. And I feel sort of in the spot and a bit anxious. And I go, well, <laughs> so I move to the other side, you know, because I got embarrassed because I refused to share a pool noodle with a two-year-old kid. <laughs> Regarding my fear of the ocean, I sort of overcame it with uh, a trip to Malaysia in June, end of May. I went to Langkawi Island and uh, we, me and my friends, we went island hopping there. And um, so once we reached, I forget the name of that spot, um, there was a lake there. So I rented a life jacket. And on the boat towards that island hopping, there was a large, as in a tall Egyptian man with us as well. Um, he was super excited. He had a GoPro on him. He was loving the life. He was supposed to come with his wife, but she noped out of it. She's like, nah, I'm not going to do it. So he just came alone. Um, and I told the guy, I'm like, I can't swim. I can't even float. So I'm going to try to do this. In the, and in that lake, dude, I laid down. And I floated and I swam. And that man looked super proud of me. He had this, his, this, this kindness into his eyes that I was able to experience. He probably felt bad for me because I'm a grown man and I can't swim. And um, what's interesting about that is that on the way back, uh, the two boats that went for island hopping, they were like racing each other. So... Our guy realized as he's sitting in the front um, that the weight at the back of the boat was a bit more than the front. So he asked me to move up in the front, sort of even up the weight. So now I'm just hanging on to dear life like a Viking. And as it's just he is he is moving with the lightning speed hitting the waves in the ocean, he's just 
and we are four feet up, six feet up, and I look down and all I see is blue. You know how scary that is? We've only discovered 10% of the ocean. All the marine or the aquatic life, the shipwrecks, the species, the hurricanes, the Bermudas, the yada, 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 all of that is only 10% of the ocean that we know of. So when I look at the video of a drone footage of a surfer just surfing around having fun from the top angle and underneath is all blue, that's super freaky, dude. And you can never tell me that it's not. Because it is. Because you don't know what's down there. Sunlight stops at 3,000 feet. After that, hello darkness, my old friend, and even more. Because you don't know what other friends you've got in there. All you need is to just get like a little like tap by like a whale fin. And that's a wrap. Recently, I saw like a TikTok or in, an Instagram actually of like a fish with the human teeth and lips, which was in the ocean. Where is all this coming from? All this new stuff, giant squids and stuff. Maybe that's old, but I don't care. And weird fish from the, from the depths of, like of the ocean. Why are we doing this? Why do we want to know? Stop it. It's scary. And people who surf and people who can just do this on their own the ocean, I, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I envy you. I wish, I, 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 I really wish I could swim or have had like the courage to not freak out in the water because, oh my God. And you see this uh, when they go like whale watching and stuff, like those whales, they come up and they whale themselves down so close to the boats. All it needs to do is just move a little closer towards like the right or the left. Well, the other way, the left or the right. And then your history, dude. And the other video that I watched was, uh, so there's like people on the boat and then they look underneath and there's this like, giant fish just going and gulping water by gallons in a second. Off Vitor saying, goodbye, Allah Hafiz to you and everything you stand for. I will never, ever take part in that. That's my worst fear of drowning or being ingested by a fish. Moving on to some interesting facts about the ocean. So being in Australia, uh, surfing, swimming is a big part of the culture. You should be able to at least know how to swim. I know how to swim, I just can't float. So as I said before, I sort of, I, I'm moving, I cover distance, but I'm slowly sinking, like hopes and dreams. Um, the ocean is called Mamba Kurth in the Aboriginal First Nations language. Bet you didn't know that. Australia is also home to beautiful beaches. Um, you've got Jarvis Beach, you've got Hames Beach, and in addition to that, it also is home to the Great Barrier Reef, which has over 1,700 species of coral, and that's amazing, and that's amazing to watch on television rather than actually seeing it, because you don't know what's in there. What's in there? is also different kinds of sharks. Namely, the tiger shark, the bull shark, and the great white shark. Now, sharks don't prey on humans. I've been told that. It's out there. It's probably scientific research. But they are attracted to blood and urine, which every person has. But that's okay. Sharks don't attack humans but they're also naturally aggressive and they get confused a lot. 
So, because of that confusion, and them being a shark, they bite on propellers, they can rip your limbs, your legs, your arms, your head, a chunk of your ribs, your chest, your butt, who knows, because they get confused sometimes. No thank you. Another interesting fact about sharks in Australia is that they're not just in the ocean. They also have the ability to swim up the rivers, dude. Nowhere is safe. They could be anywhere. And I found that the hard way as well. I was at Hames Beach on the other side, not at the ocean, but in the river. You could see some crabs. The water was probably three, four feet. I'm thinking, let's learn how to float. So I ask my mate, I say, hey man, this water is okay, right? And he goes, it's fine. And as I'm trying to float, I ask him, I'm like, do it can't have any sharks, right? Because the ocean is there. And the answer was, not always. And as he said that, something immediately touched my leg and that was seaweed, but I stood up so fast. And that was the last time that I tried to learn how to float around the ocean. Because I'm not going to do that. It's too much fear. So you can be bitten in the ocean. You can be bitten in the river. But sharks don't hunt humans, so you're fine. Even though there are 15 incidents recorded every year of some sort of a shark interaction. And 37 people that have been recorded so far have been consumed by sharks. I found about this first from the YouTube channel called Casual Geographic. Uh, if you haven't seen that, I would highly advise to check out those videos. They are highly informative and funny and entertaining as well. In the 1960s, there was a NASA funded project headed by Dr. John Lilly, uh, which involved teaching dolphins how to talk. There were two female and one young male dolphin involved in this research project. Margaret Lovat was an intern who helped Dr. John teach and interact with these dolphins. These dolphins were kept separate with the young male in a pool and then the two females downstairs in another pool. They were trying to teach these creatures to make sounds and speak English. Firstly, ha ha ha, how can you do that? That's an animal. Secondly, they were also given LSD. The young dolphin's name, the male, the male young dolphin, his name was Peter. And Peter was attached to Margaret. And she would interact with them. She would stay there and spend a lot of time with these dolphins. Especially Peter. One day, Peter was rubbing against Margaret's leg. And she realized that being a young male dolphin, Peter was frustrated. So Margaret relieved a dolphin because logistically it was too hard to take him downstairs to the females. So the human volunteered. Nonetheless, um, this research was eventually closed down and Margaret would go on to get married and have three kids with a human while Peter, sadly, could not withstand that separation with his human and decided to keep the experience of this life short. Laced up on LSD. 
God damn it. Moving on from that, uh, I want to tell you an interesting fact that I found about the gray whales. The gray whales mate in threes. There's two males and one female. The smaller male volunteers to act as a bed for female to lie on like a pillow princess so the larger male can continue the activity. This is fascinating. The larger man gets his uh, the first turn. Being not a larger man myself, I um, I uh, <laughs> if you've liked this episode about the ocean facts please make sure to like comment and subscribe subscribe now to the channel and switch on the bell notification so you can be aware of whenever i upload a short or release a new episode of the podcast I will leave you with a jewel, a very, very important piece of advice that you can use in life. A wise man once said, well, he recorded, that in life, tough time don't last. Only tough people last. <laughs> My name is Umar Elias. Thank you for watching All Things Ilyas podcast. And um, I will see you next week. <laughs>